Well, good morning. Every day on my way to uh, school, I usually pray this prayer. Well, pretty much every day. You know the scripture that says, This is the day that the Lord hath made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. And sometimes we have to be reminded of that. I thought about a couple of little kids on my bus just this last week. They uh, were having a little conversation, and I don't hear a lot of things on the bus because I turned my hearing aids down, but uh, <laughs> they were close enough that I could hear them. And they were talking about, for some reason, I had gotten onto the kids for being too loud. You know, sometimes kids get pretty loud, and then they ratchet it up, and they just keep getting louder and louder and louder. So we were going along, and I heard a couple of little kids behind me talking, and they said, said, our, our, our preacher is loud. He's loud? Yeah. And I said, our preacher is pretty loud. And the other one said, well, mine screams. I said, he just screams at us. And I want to tell you this morning, I'm recovering from about three weeks of a head cold and uh, a cold, so I won't be screaming at you today, I promise. I want to turn, i tell you what's been on my heart. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough world we live in. And we can look around and we don't want to make a bunch of excuses for ourselves, but, uh, but it is tough. Sometimes things don't don't go right. And then sometimes people don't go right. And sometimes our life just kind of gets dreary and, uh, and we get to thinking about, well, I, I wish I were here or I wish I were there or I wish I was doing this or I wish I was doing that and, uh, or I could have done this or I could have done that. And it's tough on us. But we need to be encouraged as Christians that uh, uh, just like the old songwriter said, this world is not my home. I'm here, and I'm supposed to do the very best that I can while I'm here, but this is not my home, and I'm not staying around one minute longer than when the Lord yells out from heaven, Marvin, it's your time, I'm out of here, and I'm gone. But in the meantime, I need to be encouraged sometimes. I need to, to uh, uh, you know, get a little shot of adrenaline to, uh, to pep things up. I want to start this morning with a scripture that you're going to think, well, where is he going to go with this? But I am going somewhere with it. And I want to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 5. I'm sorry, verse 7. One of the things I did this morning was forgot my glasses, so... I may have to do like the pastor I knew one time. He was blind, completely blind, and he had this great big old huge Braille Bible. And uh, I asked him one time, I said, how do you remember all those scriptures? He said, I'm not remembering them. I'm reading them with my fingers while I'm talking. And that's exactly what he did. And I may have to do a little of that today myself. Then the Lord God formed man out of the dust from the earth or the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So God brought man into existence. Into cre he created him. He'd been working hard all week, creating first this thing and another, and we're enjoying that still today. And then he saved the very best for last, and he created man, and he did it out of the dust of the earth. He took a pile of dust. I planted some trees yesterday in my yard, and I went out there with a pick and a bar and a shovel. I mostly used the bar, and I, I done my best to dig, and all I got was this powdery old earth. That's all I had to put those poor little trees in. And I thought about this as I was doing that. God picked up something that we would never even give another notice to and decided that he would make a man. And then a little bit later, not to give away any secrets, he took that man and worked on him a little bit and come up with a better uh, being, and that is a woman. That's all the brownie points you'll get today, ladies, from me. But uh, 
uh, he took a part here and there, and he come up with a woman. But what I really want to talk about today is that sometimes with the worries of what goes on in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis, and I don't think that anybody has ever lived in a time where they were more busy than what we are, where there were more distractions than what we have, where there were more options than what we have. I, uh, man has just not lived in a time like that. We have so many things at our fingertips today. Every morning it's like not, uh, well, I've got one or two things I could do, but it's how many of these do I want to eliminate so that I can do one or two and, and, and enjoy it? And we get that away and we get to thinking about, well, maybe I just can't do much at all. There's times in our lives when we get up in the morning and we think about who we are, where we came from, what's going on in our life, and we think about God and we say, how could God use me? Because, you know, I'm, there's just not much about me. Well, uh, several people have uh, taken uh, s some verses of Scripture out of David's life and put them together, and if you ever want to uh, do a little Bible study, which it turns out it'll be a quite large Bible study, but uh, study uh, the word unremarkable related to men and related to the Bible, and you're going to get back a bunch of information about uh, unremarkable, the word unremarkable, and men and women in the Bible. Every man and woman on earth came from that little bit of dust that God picked up and decided to make man out of. That's where they came from, all of us, no matter if we're the president of the United States or uh, just whoever you want to choose, uh, however a lowly a job a person might could have or what station in life they might could have, all of us came from that same little piece of earth. We were all started out in dust and something else the scripture tells us, we're going to end up that way too. We're going to go back to that same dust. But some people manage to really shine in this life. Some people, you just can't take your eyes off of them. Some people, you see the things that they're accomplishing and you're thinking, man, if I could just do a tenth of that, wouldn't I be something? And you look at them and look at them and David might be one of them. We read about David, he's been talked about, preached about, uh, studied uh, ever since the Bible uh, hit the bookshelves. But David was a man, the scripture says, who was the apple, for my words, the apple of God's eye. He was the person that God looked at and said, I can use them. But what about David? And what about his life and where he came from? We all know the story, but I want us to be reminded this morning. You know, James said, over in the book of James, that he wanted to stir up the pure minds of people sometimes. And I think that's what we need today, is to have as Christians our pure minds stirred up to a point where we remember who we are. We remember where we came from. We remember God's rescue of our soul. And we remember what God has in mind for us. Sometimes we just sink down into... Uh, you know, nothingness, but that's not God's intention. So God took this little boy, David, who was a shepherd, who in his day, shepherds were not highly esteemed. He was the youngest of all of Jesse's sons, so he's the one that had to go out and tend the sheep. Tending the sheep, some of you may be sheep people, I don't know. I know nothing about sheep except they stink, and if you touch them, you get greasy. That's, that's all I, I know about them. I did eat a leg of lamb once, prepared by a person who actually knew how to cook them, and it was quite good. But I wouldn't go through the mess of getting to that leg of lamb for it. But anyway, that's just me. But uh, David was a shepherd, and he was the youngest of the kids, so he had to go out and stay with the sheep. So he had a lot of time on his hands, but it was also a job. He, uh, sheep are not real smart. You have to literally kind of take them up to the blade of grass and show them, here, here's one you can eat. 
and, and you know, they will. You can't get them in water. You, you have water for them, but you can't really uh, get them out there and uh, uh, say, you know, you're on your own. You will never go by a pasture and see a bunch of sheep floating in the pond out there like the cows, will you? Because they're afraid of water. They're afraid of everything because sheep, someone said, just are born looking for a place to die. And, and that's pretty much how they are. So if you're the shepherd, you've got to try to protect them because dad said you're in charge. You're in charge of the sheep. So if you shepherd sheep long enough in that kind of setting, pretty soon you start smelling like a sheep, and pretty soon you might even start acting like one. I don't know, but uh, uh, it kind of gets in your blood. So the prophet Samuel came to Jesse's house one day and said, uh, well, let me preface that with this. First, Samuel came to town. And what was the first words out of the people's mouths? Uh, you're not mad at us, are you? You're not coming in anger. No, I'm not coming in anger. I'm going to celebrate. We're going to sacrifice. And so uh, they said, okay, we quit shaking and, and you can come in. Uh, but he went to David's dad, Jesse's house. And while he was out there, he said, I want to see your sons. Because Samuel knew that God had sent him there to anoint the next king of Israel. And so he had all of his sons, and the oldest was the best looking, the tallest, and the brightest. And so he brought him in, Eliab, and, and, he, and Samuel saw him, and he thought, this is surely the guy that God wants. Because what, whom had the people picked just uh, a, a few uh, decades before? They had picked Saul. Why did they pick Saul? Because Saul was tall, Saul was okay to look at, and he was pretty gib. I mean, he could talk even though he was shy. Uh, Saul looked like a king, and what did the people want? They wanted a king really bad. And they, uh, they, they told uh, the prophet, they said, we want a king just like everybody else has got a king. And he said, I don't think so. And oh, yes, that's what we want. So that's what they had chosen. So Samuel got there, and here was this big strapping guy. And, uh, you know, he looked, he looked perfect for the job as far as Samuel was concerned. And God said no. So he commenced to parading all the, little, uh, the brothers by him. And Samuel, every time one had come by, talked about rejection. You know, nope, nope, nope. Uh, we're not, we're, I don't want any of these. And he turns to Jesse and says, Jesse, you got any more boys? And Jesse said, well, I've got this little runt out watching sheep. Well, he said, go get him. He said, why? Well, because I want to look at him. And so he's, the messenger was sent out into the fields, I guess, to take uh, uh, David's place. And David come in and Saul took one look at him, whipped out his oil, his quart of uh, uh, pins oil, and poured it right on top of David's head and said, now you're, a, you're anointed. You're the next king of Israel. I don't know what David thought about that. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine coming in and uh, you're, you're a shepherd and all your brothers are bigger and older and think they're smarter than you and you're out there and he brings in and here's this old prophet Samuel who everybody adored and, and people were afraid of and loved at the same time and, and he pulls out his horn of oil and he pours it on your head and says, you're the next king. But then this bizarre thing happens. He just, they get up and leave. And there's David, get back out there with those sheep uh, with his oily head. He looked probably more like the sheep now with all that oil on him and uh, uh, get back out there with the sheep. And a, a, a time passed. And in that time, uh, David is still out there, but the, but the scripture says from the time that Samuel poured the oil on David's head that the Spirit of God uh, dwelt in him and began to deal with him and change him. He still was the shepherd. He still was the youngest son. He may or may not have been a runt. I don't know. But uh, 
people seem to think he might have been. But anyway, he was out there uh, still doing the same things that he had always done. And it looked like to him that really nothing was going to change. He didn't know what Samuel had done to him. But as the story goes along, pretty soon, uh, you know, Saul's getting crazier and crazier in his job. And uh, 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 someone said, look, I think it'd do you some good if you had a harp player here to kind of calm you down when you get off on one of these terrors and start screaming at people. Or you get down in the dumps and you go into the dark room and you won't come out. So they said, well, who could we get? And someone said, well, said Jesse has a son who doesn't have much to do. He just hangs around with the sheep out there. But he's a really good harp player because he's had a lot of time to practice out there with the sheep. And uh, uh, we'll bring him up here. So they did. And he played his harp for Saul. Apparently he was quite good at it, or at least Saul thought so. And uh, they, they became uh, friends, as friendly as you can uh, get with someone like that. And, and David began to succeed. And uh, he would go back and forth. And then pretty soon Saul said, hey, I want him here full time to take care of me. And so he came in and, uh, and the, the story goes on and on. But he's still going back and shepherding the sheep. And then I want to get to uh, chapter 17. I don't want to run out of time before we tell the story, I love the story of David and Goliath. Uh, why do I love the story? I don't know. I just do. I love it. I know probably a lot of people like it. Some people don't believe it. Uh, you know, on and on and on. But uh, eventually, Israel lined up on this mountain, and uh, uh, the Philistines got over on this one. They were probably about a mile apart. There was about a half mile of mountain slope like that. And down in the valley, there was this dry stream bed with a few old rocks laying around in it. And uh, while David was out there tending his sheep, the dad got uh, uh, kind of concerned because his three oldest sons had gone to the war. And uh, so far, the war hadn't gone that well. Nothing had really happened. He's wondering what's going on. So one day, he calls in uh, David and says, uh, you know, I want you to go by McDonald's and get three Happy Meals and take them up there to the boys on the front lines. So David loads up his, really, his cheese and bread and all the things that they had in those days to eat. That would be weary to me, just eating cheese and bread. But anyway... He took the cheese and bread and he, and he went up to the battle lines, had no idea what was going to go on, although he was curious as to what was happening there at the time, but he had no idea what was really going to happen at all. Not at all. He wasn't nervous. He wasn't concerned. He wasn't anything. He was just going up there and doing what his father said. He took the food up there. Then he seen them out here on this mountainside, and they, they were brave soldiers. They would stand out there and shout at each other. That's what they did. They didn't do any battle. They just stood out there and yelled at each other. And, uh, and then the giant would eventually come down, Goliath, and he would challenge one of them to uh, uh, battle, and then they would all run back over on the other side of the mountain. And they did that for 40 days. And on the 40th day, David showed up. And they were all lined up, and he was taking the meal up there to his brothers and see what was going on. And, and down the side of that mountain comes this guy, Goliath, who, if we put it in today's terms, was nine foot, nine inches tall, a little taller than I am, nine foot nine. And uh, uh, it, it said that he, he had a, a, a coat of armor that weighed around 200 pounds, a little heavier than I am and that he had a spearhead that weighed between 20 and 25 pounds, if you can imagine, with a shaft the size of a weaver's beam. And then he had this javelin on his back, and he had a, a, a big old uh, 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 bearer in front of him that had this great big shield that was as tall as a normal man. And he's boom, boom, boom down the mountain. You know, a guy like that couldn't be very athletic, you'd think. And uh, he's coming down the mountain, and David's looking over at him, and uh, 
Uh, and then uh, he, uh, he gives his, uh, Goliath gives his, his speech, challenges them to come down and they'd fight one man against the other and then however it turned out, that would be the way the battle went. And David's sitting there watching that and then all of a sudden he turns around and looks and there ain't nobody behind him. They're all gone. They take off. There stands David. David's not thinking about how big is Goliath. Tell you a little funny story. I got time to tell a funny story about that. I don't know if you've ever got a chance to hear Charles Swindoll or not, but uh, he tells a story about going to church one day in his Volkswagen carrying Goliath with him. Have you heard that story? And he's got Goliath and uh, uh, he's got him outside the car because nine foot nine inches, it won't fit in the Volkswagen bug. And so he's got him outside and he's holding him with his arm and he said he's driving the streets and the wind's blowing and he's hurrying and he's going to church on Sunday morning and the wind's flapping and Goliath starts cutting up outside of there and flapping around a little bit and, and he said, well that's, well, that's pretty cool. And so then he got to letting him flap some more and he's flapping, flapping. He says he goes around the curve and there sets a cop. And the cop goes like this. He said, I knew what that meant. He wasn't just waving at me. He wants me to pull over. So he said, I, I pull over and said, the cop walks up there and he said, um, he said, where are you going? He said, well, I'm, going, I'm headed to church. I, I'm a pastor. I'm headed to church. He said, you are? Yeah. He said, well, you, you know, you think that's safe, uh, hauling that thing outside? Well, he said, it won't fit in the car. It, it won't fit in the car. We said, just who are you? Well, he said, I'm the pastor of that church right down there. He said, get in your car and go on down to that church. Go on down there. The cop just, he didn't want to deal with it. He didn't want to, he didn't want to talk, tell everybody in the police station that he arrested a man going down the road in a Volkswagen carrying Goliath by his arm out the window. I'm sure that's why he didn't. And so he had this, this, this thing that's nine foot, nine inches tall that he set up on the stage, he said, so people could see just how big Goliath was. Well, Goliath was huge, and David wasn't even thinking about that. You know what David was thinking about? He said, he's dissing my Lord, and I don't like it. David did have red hair, we think. He said he was ruddy, that's red. Uh, red hair, sparkly eyes, and handsome to look at, but he was still just a shepherd. So he's, he's, he's challenged. And so he yells back at this guy. He says, oh, you can't do that. And Goliath said, oh, yes, I can. He said, you're nothing but a little bitty boy. And said, I'll feed you to the birds. Now, David, that morning, didn't put his Glock 45 on or nothing. All he had was a bag and a stick. He had a stick. He picked up a stick the scripture says, and he found some stones in the bottom of that, that uh, uh, little creek bed there, a dry creek bed, and he puts the, uh, five stones. You remember singing that song when you're a little bitty kid? David, I can't remember it all because my mind is pretty much shot, but, uh, you know, around and around and around and around, and, and I can remember that part, but uh, <laughs> they never would really give me a sling. I don't know why, but they never let me have the sling. But anyway, uh, he picked it up. He loaded his sling up with five shots and uh, put it in there. And Goliath, meanwhile, is trudging down the mountain. Well, Goliath had this big old huge brass helmet and all this other stuff, bronze. And he didn't even put down his, the front of it. He was not concerned about David at all. Meanwhile, back in the camp, before David's doing all this stuff, Saul had him up in his tent, and he put all of his stuff on him, and he said, uh, now you can go down there. David, the scripture says, it's quite hilarious. He tried to walk and said, wait a minute, I can't go in this. I can't even move that. If you hung a 200-pound coat of mail on me, I couldn't walk either. And David said, I can't walk. And Saul says, well, so David strips down to his uh, fighting weight, whatever that is, and Saul runs back to his tent. Saul, the man who should have been fighting Goliath. He said he was a head and shoulders above all the rest of Israel. 
which didn't mean anything to God as far as whether or not he could whip Goliath or not. But he should have been the one that was, but he wasn't. So David goes down there, and he, the giant starts getting closer and closer. David doesn't hang around and wait around to see what's going to happen. He reaches in, he grabs a stone, he runs toward the man, and, and I've read and talked to people where in parts of the country where the world, where they still use those things, you can become very accurate with a sling like that. And it's absolutely a deadly weapon. And he hits Goliath right up here between the headlights. And Goliath, the rock, he says it hit him so hard that it sunk in and Goliath falls like a big tree. Kapunk. David don't have a sword. David don't have anything, so he goes up. He can't ask Goliath if he can borrow his sword because Goliath is knocked out. So David takes his sword, pulls it out of there, uh, kills him with it, and cuts his head off. They did things differently then than what we would do today. When your enemy was down, they made sure he stayed down. So he cut his head off, and he, I can just see him going back up that hill. But in the meantime, the Philistines are watching they see this little run of a guy go down there and do some kind of a trick and their champion falls down and then he chops his head off and they head for the high country. And uh, then all of a sudden, the armies got really brave and they come running down and they chased them and shot them in the back all the way until there was hardly any of them left uh, at all. And all because David did not look at the giant as a giant. David looked at the giant as someone who was profaning the name of God. David looked at the giant and said, you're not going to treat my Lord that way. And he didn't for very long. That was the last day that he, he was on this earth, the last day that he was alive. But it's interesting to me for someone to start out as average and as unremarkable, just a shepherd boy, even below average, really, probably, if you, if you really think about it, and then do something like that and change the lives of all of those people and champion uh, the name of God and, and turn things around completely in that area, all because he trusted God. Now, what's the difference today than in the day that David lived? There is no difference. Yes, we've got people, you know, the news media, they don't like us. Uh, there's a bunch of elitists on the left and the right coast. They don't like us. There's a bunch of people in Europe. They don't like Christians. There's people everywhere. They don't like Christians. But that doesn't mean that we can just not... Just take it all and never do anything about it. Now, I wouldn't uh, advise taking a sling and some rocks and going after anybody. But in the name of God, there's a lot of things can be accomplished if you believe it. And so whatever station of life that we might find ourselves in, we have that same privilege today. In the name of God, we can conquer all things if we'll accept it, if we'll do it, if we'll think about it. Now, I've got some other examples. I'm not going to belabor them. I'm just going to run through them. Something for you, I think they're in the bulletin, you can look at and uh, uh, you might want to think about some of these men. Amos, the sycamore fig picker, is another guy that I really like. What about old Amos? Well, God picked him, and he didn't like it. He didn't want it. He didn't want that job. He was a farmer, and that's what he wanted to stay, was just a farmer. That's who he thought he was. But God said, no, that's not who you are. You're a prophet. You're going to go You're going to go tell Jeroboam what I think about what's going on around here. And boy, did he. Finally, he gave it up, and he did it, and, and they didn't like it. And the head priest came to his house and said, you can't say things like that. You can't talk to our king like that. You gotta, you're, you're not going to be able to do that. 
Jeroboam looked him right in the eye, and I quote, this is what he said. I mean, uh, Amos said, I am not a prophet, nor am I the son of a prophet, for I am a herdsman and a grower of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. And he said, if it breaks every cow's leg in Texas, that's what I'm going to do. And he did. And he never backed away from it. That could be us. Peter. What did Peter do? Peter was a fisherman. Now, Peter was a great guy. I really like to study Peter, and I really like to think about some of the things that Peter had to say and, and some of the things that he did in his life. But he wasn't a great guy until he was filled with the Spirit of God. He wasn't that great a guy. He was a fisherman. He went out, he dropped the net, he pulled it in, he counted the catch. He went out, he dropped the net, he pulled it in, he counted the catch. He was a leader among probably the fishermen around there, but that's all that he was until Jesus said, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Forget about the ocean. Well, the Sea of Galilee. Forget about the water. Forget about that kind of stuff. Now I've got something else for you. And Peter did. Peter fell down, Peter got up, Peter fell down, Peter got up, and he kept on going. And the third one I want to just briefly mention this, this, this morning was, you remember this, the guy named Jason in, in the New Testament who uh, uh, happened to be in Thessalonica, and Paul and Silas were there, and Paul and Silas were telling it like it is, and people were getting mad, mostly religious people. They were getting all upset, and, and uh, they got a mob together. And in that mob, they, they were going to take them and do what mobs usually do. But somehow or another, they didn't get it made. But they got Jason, but they didn't get Paul and Silas. But they got this guy, Jason. And Jason was only guilty of letting Paul and Silas stay in his house. That's all he did. But he said, if I can be of help... I will, uh, you can stay in my place and, and you'll have a nice place here to, uh, as headquarters. So they, they took uh, Jason and they arrested him and they did all of this stuff. It's like, okay, I'm going to mob somebody for uh, robbing the bank, but they don't catch the bank robbers, so they just knock on your door and say, hey, you'll do. We'll string you up. Not very fair, but that's the way it happened. But Jason didn't back up from that. You see, we think about Bible heroes. We think about uh, uh, David, and we think about Daniel, and we think about Ezekiel, and we think about all those prophets, and we think about Peter, Paul, and Mary. Yeah, they were all there. We think about them, and we think, man, they must have been super something, but they weren't. They were just regular people whom God had touched and they believed it. They believed God. So don't let this world get you down because when you do, you're, you're out of God's will because God has something for each and every one of us in this room this morning. And there might be somebody here today that's feeling, you know, really low. I don't know. And if you're that person, I want you to be encouraged. You can be of use to God. You can be of use to your, your community in the name of Jesus. You can be of use to your church and, and all the things around you. There's a jillion things that you can do to encourage people and lift people up and, and move forward. You can mow somebody's lawn. You can do something. But we just have to realize that God did not call us to do nothing. He called us to do something. And nobody started at a better spot than someone else. We all started from the dirt. And we're all going back to the dirt. But in the meantime, God is encouraging you to reach your full potential. Just a few minutes ago, we watched a little skit about inviting someone. And I know that for some people, that's a really, uh, a really tough thing to do. 
but do this for me. From now until two weeks when this happens, just pray every day. Don't miss a day. Pray every day. Lord, show me somebody. Send me somebody. Help me find somebody, some way, somehow, that I can invite to church. And God, I'm confident, will do that. If you will just stay in there and pray and seek God and let him work in your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your love. Lord, I know that some of us started out with in a little better place than, than others. I know, Lord, that uh, uh, there's a lot of things that go into our lives, uh, the history, our history, what we do, what we've said, what we've been, who, who we, where we came from, how we got here. All of that makes a difference. But none of it makes so much difference that we can't be of use for you. So just like David and his bag of stones, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to find our weapon of choice and to use it for the kingdom of God, to be encouraged, not discouraged. This world we live in is a wicked world, but you're still a good God. You're still the Lord of the heavens and the earth. Help us to be glad and rejoice every day that we live. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hi, thank you for watching. If you want to see more great content like this, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to ring the little bell to be notified when we add new videos. Since our founding in 1877, our goal here at Arnhart has been to create God-centered teaching available for everyone regardless of their status or station. Today, that looks like making trustworthy Bible teaching available to everyone, even if they don't make it to a church building on Sunday. So for more information, check out our website at arnhart.org or join us live on Facebook Sundays at 1045 a.m. As always, we love you and hope to see you next Sunday.